Hi. For many years, I taught the graduate logic course at the University of Texas at Austin. I don't teach it much anymore, mostly because we have lots of other great people in the department who also teach logic. And so usually they do it. My turn comes around only occasionally. But I thought it might be valuable to talk about at least some of the topics that I cover in the graduate logic seminar here at the University of Texas so that you can get some idea about basic logical concepts. It can be hard to understand some of these ideas apart from a real course in the subject. And I've never done this really in the YouTube version, so I thought I would begin by doing that. Now, what is this course all about? Well, it's about logic, the science of inference. But I think I should start by saying a little bit about what logic is. It is the study of inference, how we go from one body of information to additional bodies of information, to additions to it that allow us to draw conclusions from a set of premises. Well, logic, if we think of it that way, the science of inference, is a normative discipline it's trying to distinguish good inferences from bad inferences. It starts with Aristotle. Aristotle said that in logic he couldn't adopt his usual strategy of reviewing the common opinions. Before him, he reports, there was nothing at all. Now, there has been a dramatic transformation of logic in the last century or so. It is remarkable in a way because for a long time it seemed as if logic really developed incrementally, very little was being added. In fact, Immanuel Kant, in the preface to the second edition of the Critique of Pure Reason, said that it's remarkable that to this present day that logic has not been able to advance a single step and is thus to all appearance a closed and completed body of doctrine. Well, he couldn't have been more wrong. Within a few decades, George Boole and others would transform logic completely from a discipline that still was very much like it was in Aristotle's time to something that was highly mathematical. George Boole, around the middle of the 19th century, said that logic rests on a theory of classes. Now, Boole's logic, which has given us Boolean algebra and a variety of other concepts, nevertheless was a bit of a mess. If you look at it in the original forms, and it took a variety of forms during Boole's lifetime, it is rather confusing and not very similar to contemporary logic. But Boole did have this idea that logic can be studied mathematically and that it's about classes, or as we think of them now, sets. Charles Sanders Peirce, a few decades later, came up with a comprehensive theory of quantification, that is to say, a theory of all and some, and incorporated that into what had been a separate logical tradition of and, or if, then, and not. He also had a theory that incorporated relations. Independently, the German mathematician Gottlob Frege had come up with the same thing. He really laid the basis for modern predicate logic. He had a recursively defined language and an axiomatic proof system. His system of notation was rather awkward and not something that people generally use now at all. Nevertheless, the core of modern logic is already there in Frege. So the first revolution in logic was that mathematical revolution the revolution that introduced the idea that logic could be studied mathematically and was ultimately a theory of classes. The second revolution occurred early in the 20th century with Lewis and Langford, who developed the idea that the if-then treatment that went all the way back to the Stoics in contemporary logic was inadequate to what we really meant in language by if-then. Moreover, it was a serious limitation of logic that it didn't include concepts like possibility and necessity. So they introduced modal logic, something that had been discussed even in Aristotle and in the Middle Ages without coming to any very firm theory of what was going on with modal concepts such as possibility and necessity. So the first part of this revolution was the addition of a modal logic, a logic of possibility and necessity. And then people realized this is actually the core of a much broader logic, or set of logical techniques, you might say, that gives you a theory of obligation and permission, a theory of belief and knowledge, and a variety of other related concepts. It was also the core of what became a theory of the conditional, of if-then statements, recognizing the inadequacy of the ordinary 
kind of approach to it then, which works moderately well in mathematical context, but not very well in ordinary language. And in addition, people developed the idea that we should really think not always in terms of two truth values, truth and falsehood, but that we needed a broader sense. Some people said, look, there are degrees of truth, degrees of falsehood. Maybe we need a spectrum here. Others said, well, there are sentences that are neither true nor false. And in addition, some people have even said, there really are sentences that are both true and false. Or at least we can think of information states where we have the information that something is true and we have the information that it's false, conflicting sources of information. So we'll come back to those ideas much later. The third revolution in logic is something that occurred near the end of the 20th century and has been going on in the 21st century. It involves the development of a theory of generalized quantifiers. Aristotle combines a relational conception of the quantifiers with a monadic conception of terms. Modern logic, a monadic conception of quantifiers with a relational conception of terms. People have begun to realize an adequate theory really needs both. They should have relational conceptions of both quantifiers and terms, but that requires going beyond Aristotelian logic and beyond modern quantification theory to something richer, to develop a logic of concepts like most, or all but finitely many, or all but countably many. And so that has been done largely by mathematicians, but also by logicians and philosophers over the second half of the 20th century. In addition, computer scientists and linguists began to recognize that much of our common sense reasoning does not proceed by anything like deduction, where the truth of the conclusion is guaranteed by the truth of the premises, nor does it really consist of inductive reasoning of the kind studied by probability and statistics. Instead, it's common sense sort of reasoning, like this reasoning. Birds fly. Tweety is a bird, so Tweety flies. Reasonable inference. On the other hand, it's not guaranteed that Tweety flies. Tweety might be a penguin, might be an ostrich, might have an injured wing. And so, in those cases, we have to say, well, hmm, something like Tweety flies. Birds fly, so Tweety flies. Is a good argument, a reasonable argument, but not one that guarantees the truth of its conclusion, even given that the premises are true. How do we analyze such arguments? In the absence of any probabilities, statistics, other kinds of numbers that would allow us to assimilate this to another kind of paradigm. Non-monotonic logic, or common sense reasoning, attempts to analyze arguments like that. Finally, there's been a recognition that sentences are often best understood dynamically. They contain anaphoric elements, sometimes pronouns, but sometimes more indirect elements. They simply omit a verb phrase, for example, in a process that linguists call ellipsis. They might contain tenses or other aspectual features of language that make reference to earlier times without making it explicitly. And there are other elements, too, in attitude contexts where we seem to have reference to other things embedded within attitude contexts. We'll talk much more about those later, but the idea here is that we need then to think of a sentence not simply as representing the world as having truth conditions, but instead as being something that transforms one context into another context. The sentence adds to a body of already existing information, and sometimes we need to think of it as that kind of addition to or revision of, or in some other way transformation of a body of information, because we need to understand the elements of that existing body of information that allow us to specify various things going on in the sentence itself, especially in regard to those anaphoric elements. So what am I going to be trying to do in this series of lectures? Well, basically, to give you enough logic to give you a sense of what modern logic is all about, to allow you to use logic in various kinds of philosophical and linguistic contexts so that you'll recognize the use of logic and maybe be able to use it yourself, and also to prepare you to, to research in logic, to teach logic, to understand more about logic than you would get from just an introductory logic course. Now, at some point, I'd like to go back and do that, 
as part of my YouTube series too. But for now, we're going to assume that you know some logical bases and instead jump in at a bit higher level, thinking about the various things that have developed in that mathematical revolution, in the second revolution introducing modal and other kinds of operators, and then finally in that that has introduced things like generalized quantifiers, non-monotonic reasoning, dynamic semantics, and a variety of other more modern techniques. So that's the overall shape of what we're going to be doing. Let's jump in.